Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Intercycle Astrology channel where I'm joined by my very special guest and friend, Spencer Michaud from Spencer Michaud Astrology. Hi, Spencer. Hi, Shu. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. And um, so glad that you can join me here today. We're going to be talking about the much-anticipated Saturn moving into Pisces. So that's just around the corner. And I'm, I believe that for both of us at different ends of the world, it will be happening on the 7th of March, right? That's correct. That's right. That's correct. Yeah, well, before we get into the episode, I'd like to really officially open this by reading a prayer uh, written by Reverend Jangle Bones. And he's kindly given me the permission to share this beautiful prayer with you. Um, because I've been using this as part of my daily practice um, recently, and they are just exquisite. This is from his uh, book. I'm not sure now how new it is now, but it's called The New Prayers to the Seven Planets. And here we go. O mighty, endless God, whose unfathomable presence frightens the void, who shakes the bedrock and topples empires, I, the wretched and unworthy, Beg the height of your compassion. Hear me and subdue me to the virtue and favour of this planet. I conjure you, O Saturn, who crumbles unstable structures to dust by trial as well as by time, by the wisdom of the ancestors, ancient and strong, by the shelter of caves and the glittering bounty of deep, dreadful mines, O oh, you who paints the honest lines of age upon the faces of all humankind, thieving colour from our hair, who inspires in plants the poisons which protect and prophesy, O oh, cold and heavy satin, rot upon the vine, hear my prayer and grant me thy virtue and favour by the following holy names, Arfin, Orkip, Orliob, Beric, Orafon, Sarok, Taimon, Odell, Sigeth, Sotar. For your above names do not disobey me, but grant your grace, power, and virtue in all of my works. Turn back your foul fortune from me, Saturn. Bring only good fortune to both me and mine, and my blessing upon you in kind, by the breath that moves over the waters and by the waters themselves. Amen. So what do you think of that prayer, Spencer? Oh, that's beautiful. I love it. It's tell me tell me a little bit more about um, the author. Reverend Jangle Bones. Uh, yeah. He is, I don't know much about him. I just came across his prayers um, on the Rune Soup membership, which I'm a part of. Uh, nice. And I just absolutely love them. And I understand uh yeah, well, I've got the links for Reverend, Reverend Jagavon's site in my description, but he does work a lot with the ancestors and the angels um, in, in quite a deep way. So I really encourage everyone to buy this book. You know, it's very affordable, uh, good to have um, for your planetary praxis, uh, as well as just having a good understanding of the essence of a planet. You know, just that little short prayer just teaches you so much about the the nature and essence of Saturn there right so yeah, really it. yeah go and check out his work so and all the links are in the descriptions below so yeah I think that prayer really paints a great picture or a great image of Saturn for us but is there anything else that comes to mind for you when you think of just Saturn on its own yeah I think that a number of things come to mind. I have a list of words here that I think that are, you know, worth worth maybe throwing out there. Consequences, exile, casting out, decay, concretization, eliminations of options to make something real, boundaries, darkness, cold, separation, maturation, opposition, balance, increasing that which is lacking, decreasing that which is excessive, fear, melancholy, weight, binding, reality check, feigned appearances, social blueprints, nemesis, restoring right proportion, eliminating excesses, hard lessons, slowing things down, patience, plodding, blockages that take time to resolve, utilizing time to overcome, confinement, 
or exile, restrictions or fetters, bindings that compel us towards action or prevent action, oaths, promises, obligations, sobriety, um, organization of form. So yeah, that's, those are just kind of like, that's my like free form poem about Saturn, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we'll add those to the uh, prayer, um, but beautiful yeah. list. And yeah, I think I'll be replaying this and jotting all those ones down because that is a really great list then. So thanks for yeah. making it easy for all of us and coming up with that. I think Saturn, you know, Saturn's interesting to me. It It's the one thing that sticks out to me that I think is, we don't hear talked about enough is the exaltation of Saturn when Libra that we were we were kind of touching on this earlier before the show. You know, there's a, a portion of the Orphic hymns, right? I've got the uh, Patrick Dunn version of the Orphic hymns here, but this is from the the um, the Taylor. Uh, I believe it's Taylor who is the 16th or 17th century author that did the English versions of these. And I thought this this really made a lot of sense to me. So I'll read just a little bit of this as well. The Orphic Hymn to Saturn. It says, Ethereal Father, mighty Titan, hear a great fire of gods and men whom all revere. Endued with various counsel, pure and strong, to whom perfection and decrease belong. Consumed by thee, all forms that hourly die, by thee restored, their former place supply. I mean, I'm just going to stop there for a second because that, that to me is... That's where I think we see the connection with Saturn balance increase and decrease. I think that oftentimes we feel Saturn is the cosmic no or the limit, but I really think there's a secret part of Saturn that is that is also about increasing something to bring it back into an equilibrium. And I, I, I think that's worth exploring, you know, like the concretization of something, like making it real, I think is... Yeah. A Saturnian thing as well. Yeah, well, I think we definitely saw that concretization, I guess, from five and a half years ago when Saturn has been strong. You know, little did we know that around Christmas 2017, when Saturn moved into Capricorn, that we were about to head on a five and a half year journey of, um, yeah, Nemesis order, like restoring proportions. Yes, in in reality, it looked like you know, the gradual crumbling down of structures um, leading to oppression, scarcity, the control and the fear. But um, so we saw those strong qualities of Saturn uh, and, and for five and a half years in its own domicile. But now that it's about to move into a Jupiterian domicile in Pisces, I mean, what, what kind of things are you anticipating with this? Because it, it's vastly different. I mean, I think... It's going to be on some level a breath of fresh air, I think, because I think when Saturn is in its own domicile, you know, the qualities of feeling exiled, cast out, trapped are strong. And I think that, you know, once it moves into a Jupiterian sign, you know, there will be other challenges, but it's, it's a, hmm. They're going to be different. And I think that generally when a planet has a benefic host, there are some challenges that are less, I wouldn't say less intense, but they're, they're, they may not feel on the surface as weighty, as heavy. I feel like this will be a slightly less heavy Saturn, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. But like, I think it's, far um, it's like Saturn maybe might not like the influence as much as we all might. <laughs> right, you know what I mean? right. Yeah, it's a softened Saturn to a degree that makes it easier for us to work with on the everyday, whereas a Saturnian, the, the essence of Saturn might struggle with the wishy-washiness of it all and having to, like what you said, um, remove the options so that we can make come to a decision, which will be interesting to see how that goes in Pisces. It feels like a strange bedfellow for for Saturn, Jupiter, and Pisces. Because to me, the essence of Pisces is a dissolving action, right? It's a dissolving of boundary, of structure. It is a merging of differentiated awareness into return to the one. And, you know, Saturn is, is sometimes separates things out and opposes things where Jupiter and Pisces is trying to bring order and, and merge things together. 
So it is a little bit of an awkward type of thing. Although I will say Jupiter and Saturn are uh, diurnal sect mates. So yeah. they do have like that in common. And I think that there's a kind of a secret relationship that I learned from Charles Obert's book, The Classical Seven Planets, that I think is interesting too, where he talks about Saturn creating the blueprint, the social blueprint that Jupiter is going to beget into form. So there's this relationship of Saturn saying, here's what is possible. And then Jupiter is saying, okay, we're going to make many different forms of this. Like Saturn is sort of like the platonic ideal of the horse, if that makes sense. And then Jupiter says, I'm going to, I'm going to make like a, a polka dot horse. I'm going to make a brown horse. I'm going to make a pink horse. I'm going to like bring these into existence. And it's drawing on that ideal of a horse though. Does that make oh, sense? Isn't that in, yeah, I've always sort of viewed it the other way around where Jupiter comes up with the vision and the plan uh, and Saturn brings it, makes it happen. But yeah, but I think what you're saying is that Jupiter has license to kind of make all these different variations of the plan. Um, right. It sounds like that's what the Obert um, description. Yeah, I mean, I have a, I can quote it if you want. Hold on. Um, I'll, I'll be here, curious to hear his. I'd be curious to hear what he has to say about this, because to me, this is this this to me is really interesting and worth talking about in this relationship, especially because Saturn is in Jupiter's domicile. Um, right. I, th I think. And and just while you're looking for that, I mean, Saturn yeah. and Jupiter have ha you know they're always in a continual dance, but like we had a significant milestone of the Saturn Jupiter synodic cycle in 2020 when they came together in a new elemental sign. So really, okay. we it's almost that like we can't talk about Saturn without talking about Jupiter. And this moment when it moves into Pisces makes that notion of the two come together even more. Like they're on the same team for something. They might not necessarily get along or have the same ideas, but they're definitely working towards something together. Well, and, myth and mythologically, they're related too, right? You have Saturn as Zeus's, or Kronos as Zeus's father, and he's swallowing all the siblings, and Zeus is the liberator. You know, it's saying, okay, like, you know, there's this containment energy with Saturn, and then there's this liberation energy with, with Ju Zupid Zupiter. Zupiter, <laughs> Zup I love that. <laughs> It's getting late over here. It's, I know. Uh, it's you. That's <laughs> like, a great. That's a great name. Jupiter. <laughs> Sorry, you're good, punchy. I found this quote though, and th this is in okay. the Jupiter section of yeah. Charles Obert's "The Classical Seven Planets: Source Text and Meaning," and he says, "Jupiter is the planet just below Saturn. Along with the Sun, they are the largest planets, so each of them has an association with rulership, power, and control." In mythology, it was interpreted in, in the mythology as it was interpreted by Plato, Proclus and others in the Platonic tradition, Jupiter or Zeus is the demiurge, the creator or architect who formed the manifest universe along the lines of patterns revealed from higher levels through Saturn. Z Jupiter is also referred to as a fabricator, working with existing materials to shape and order them. In terms of the planetary mythology, you can think of Saturn as giving creator and architect Jupiter the laws and patterns that Jupiter looks to as the template for his work. Ah, right. Okay. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, there's so many different nuances. I guess, like I've heard also, uh, I think it was Mari Garcia from Australia that talks about Saturn and Jupiter as the king and the kingdom. Hmm. I think it was... Uh, yeah, I'm not. I, I just assumed Jupiter was the king and Saturn was the kingdom, as in the operations guy, right? Like having to organize things and make things happen. Jupiter has the vision, but I'll have to check with her on that. What she what she meant by that. So, um, but maybe yeah. if you think about it with the myth, look at like how prolific Zeus was. He just like mated yeah. with everything and everyone, and he just was begetting children all you know <laughs> everywhere. That's right? right spreading the and well and then you know chronos you know th there's succession myths with saturn and jupiter with like you know chronos also usurped his father so there's this kind of like fear of being usurped by the sun that they both have shared and have passed on to one another through the relationship between oranos and chronos where he 
severed the genitals of Uranos and then they fell into the sea and you know like from that there was like the birth of Aphrodite and the and the Furies and things of that nature so um you know the castration part of it is important because this is another way we can look at Saturn Saturn castrates things into form so it castrates multiple possibilities into one specific thing so that's kind of its way of begetting things is by eliminating the other options whereas i think zeus or jupiter is begetting many different options it's saying all right i'm going to proliferate whereas saturn is concretizing things into one specific thing yep. just like a stonemason would chip away cut, cut things off to create the final piece right and yes. Saturn being such a strong archetype, well, I mean, stonemasons being such a strong archetypal image of Saturn, uh, it totally makes sense. Right, but coming to this whole Saturn-Jupiter relationship, I mean, where do you think we're, we are at right now? Like, I mean, we had that great mutation in 2020. Um, how do you see the relationship of that Saturn being in sextile to, um, to Jupiter you know, how is that going to be playing out in collectively, like in, in culture, in the world? Where are we at in this 20-year cycle? Yeah, so the ancient astrologers looked at those Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions as like a new blueprint, right, for humanity, if we we can call it, I would say. And it's it's a 20-year a cycle, like you were saying, but when we get to the 10-year portion of it we get the opposition and then jupiter becomes the overcoming planet so right now saturn is still in the overcoming position to jupiter so i think that there's a we're still grasp grappling with integration of what that jupiter saturn conjunction was going to mean and i think on some level that jupiter saturn conjunction in air signs for the first time in like a couple hundred years right or i guess we had a previous one in libra but it was just a little little preview of the quote unquote air age mm -hmm. um i think that we're seeing a need to decentralize things i think we're seeing a need to uh utilize resources in a completely different way We've seen the uploading of consciousness into clouds, like with the air, you know, kind of the air age type of thing. Mm -hmm. I think we're grasp grappling with um, how do we have communal responsibility and what does it mean to be an individual in, in those systems that require sacrifice, that require communal responsibility, that require... Uh, working together as a whole for the, you know, the survival of the species. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we're, we're, we, we got a preview of that with Saturn and uh, Capricorn and Aquarius, where we had a global pandemic where basically Saturn was asking us, are you, this, this requires distance, this requires um, discipline, your actions do affect other people. Um, the air that you breathe literally is shared by others. And now we'll see Pluto moving into Aquarius that will be like a big shift of like, almost like a, a test. Like, oh, well, you thought that, did you pass the test during the Saturn part of this challenge? Um, and then, you know, Saturn moving into Pisces is going to be like, okay, now what is what is real and what isn't? Like, are I, this is the other thing I see about the transition between Aquarius and Pisces. Think about Aquarius as making things rational, making them intellectual. I would compare this to playing the guitar. When you first learn how to play an instrument, you have to learn all the theory, the music theory. You have to, to make it conscious, to make it, the movements in your hands. You practice your scales. Right? When you, when you perform, you have to... Uh, forget oh, all forget of that it. That's yeah you, it, it has to become an instinct so yeah. i think that this transition from saturn and aquarius to saturn and pisces is the we we understand the directive we we've been practicing our scales about how we're going to move forward as a all the challenges we're facing as a human human species now we have to like 
put it into, we have to have faith in it. Like we have to have faith to, to make the changes that we need to make. We need to act on our instincts and, and reconnect with our emotional center and reconnect with our why. I think this is one of the big things about Saturn and Pisces is Pisces challenges you to find your why. Jupiter challenges you to find your why. The meaning. Right, because it's it's the ninth house in the Thema Mundi. It is the, the, the philosophical natal chart of the world has Pisces on the ninth house cusp, which which is the, the, the joy of the sun, uh, the, the planet that gives us a sense of purpose, right? And also long distance journeys and pilgrimages to find meaning. It's also the cadent house before action at, at the midheaven. So what do we need before we take action out in the world? A dream, a purpose, like mm -hmm. some, some, you know, kind of feeling that will, will encourage us to keep going. When we, when we create something, it begins in the mind and it travels to the heart and then it, it we can beget it into form. And I think yeah. that we're seeing that process. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, this this stage of that Saturn-Jupiter um, cycle is, I look at it like getting a little bit, it, like niching out a bit of a groove for yourself, like in whatever you're doing, like whatever that started back in, in 2020. Um, yes, it's been challenging, but now it's like, yes, we can kind of see the way we've got a little bit of a groove and we feel comfortable to just keep going in the cycle now. So it, it feels like a really great year um, with these two planets in sextile to, to really be productive and to move forward with our dreams and to, to manifest our reality, the impossible dream, the, 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 the ideals and ideas that we've had. So yeah, that ninth half theme of Monday connection is brilliant. Um, uh, but yeah, just just um, it, like if you want to hear more about the Saturn and Jupiter cycle, I do have an interview with Charles um, Jamison, uh, who did a bit of research around this cycle um, a few years back. So we talk about it there in more detail. But um, coming back to that ninth, ninth house area, um, I wanted to look at Pisces uh, as as a concept here. And for those who may not be aware that. You are a bit of a Deccan's expert um, in the astrological community. So I just wanted to ask you if you could break down these three Deccans of Pisces um, for us um, sure. so that we can get a bit of an idea of like what we're actually going to be um, trying to concretize, you know, when Saturn moves through them. Yeah, so the Deccans are the, the three 10 degree sections of each sign and they help us to visualize, um, you know, the process that we go through when, when a planet is moving through the sign. There's sort of a beginning, a middle, an end, or a cardinal, fixed, and mutable decan in addition to uh, each decan having its own planetary ruler. So in Pisces, we're dealing with uh, a Jupiter house, but we're going to see a planetary ruler, Saturn, Jupiter and Mars. And I'm showing you tarot cards because there's a syncretization with the tarot um, from the Golden Dawn with each individual Deccan. So if we just look at it visually, we have a Saturn ruled Deccan in a Jupiter house. So you can sort of make the leap of saying, okay, this is Saturn in Pisces. This may be really the, the, uh, the experience of Saturn in Pisces is you see a figure in the Eight of Cups that is leaving behind some kind of material success or some kind of uh, fulfillment, right? It's saying, you know, this isn't actually bringing me joy. So th the first decan of Pisces is really about a feeling of dissatisfaction and discontentment. And that encourages you to go off in search of a higher purpose and a higher meaning and to maybe even go internally. And it's kind of like the you know, the, the drop in and tune out type of thing. I don't know if this was in the first Saturn and Pisces period with, you know, between 64 and 67, if that was when that kind of, that phrase, that turn of phrase came about. Um, but I, I like to compare these decans with 
the matrix, the story of the matrix would be a really good way to think about this because really Neo's journey speaks very much to the decans of Pisces. So for example, Pisces one, Neo is uh, working and he's not feeling satisfied being part of the machine, quote unquote, and he wakes up, right? He like, so he's like, oh man, he follows the white rabbit to like some new reality to some teacher that says, you know, you can, you know, stay asleep or you can wake up to the reality of your circumstances. And to me, that's like the waking up to the reality that we are not just meat suits, you know, we're not just like these fleshy bodies. We are connected in some kind of spiritual way. And, and it's all about kind of, how do we merge consciousness with, you know, our inner and outer realities? How do we reconcile those two things? So, so that's of course, basically all of 2023, we're going to be in that yeah. second and up to, a, yeah, a little bit of 2024 as well. So, so I think that what we might experience as a collective in the first second of Saturn's journey is a little bit of like, I'm over it, you know, like I'm over being online all the time or i'm i'm over trying to do the grind I, I know that when jupiter moved through pisces in the very beginning i had been grinding out content on my youtube channel I, like i was trying to do like a video like every day <laughs> like i was like and like long videos or research and i was like this grind this is killing me slowly and when jupiter moved into pisces one i was like maybe I just don't have to do it this way. Maybe I just can stop. <laughs> like, yes. So, and I started new changing possibilities coming to new. Top. Exactly. I was like, I'm done just grinding it out Saturn style. Maybe there's a different way. And I settled on, you know, doing something once a week and that felt much more comfortable for me. I was able to kind of balance out all of my uh, other responsibilities. So I think that there's a little bit of a less is more type of feeling with Saturn in the first decade of Pisces and a surrendering to the siren's call of your spirit, of your soul, um, where there's just this feeling that there's, is this all there is? And can we like move forward in a way uh, that is more reflective of our, of our emotional center and our intuition rather than just our rational mind it's it's a search for it's a wandering for a sense of purpose i think that's yeah. that's second one right and i feel like just to that the, the we're, we're in this moment like right now based on transits with jupiter still in aries and saturn about to move in pisces um there's this feeling of um not getting to that less is more yet but it's yeah. coming because jupiter is overloading in Aries, it's bringing so yeah. much to your plate that once it moves into Taurus and it makes that sextile, I think we're more going to be able to get that real Saturn uh, in Pisces deck and one kind of feeling of like, actually, this excess is not working and we have to start, um, yeah, minimizing, toning it down, or that Marie Kondoing of, of our dreams, essentially, if we want to be sustainable. Absolutely. And, and, you know, an interesting tie in with the, the Matrix movie is that um, Lana Wachowski, that one of the, the writers and directors has Saturn in Pisces and Keanu Reeves has Saturn retrograde in Pisces in the first second of Pisces. So they okay. they are, you know, building a world, you know, based on, I think, this archetype on some level. Yeah. And you um, see that happening so much where um, right an actor or an actress will have a, a configuration and whilst they may not particularly display those traits obviously in their personal lives but the roles that they take on uh, will be their chart so you right. know, they they play in this sort of special space where you know they yeah you know, their personalities or their charts kind of live on um, very publicly as well as um, very privately so it's like a projection of their inner worlds out into the material reality it's quite fascinating to see that i love making those connections it's, it's always like aha it's a it's a light bulb <laughs> moment every single time so it's very cool yeah nice one good find so you know we go through the discontent period of saturn you know austin coppett calls this this deck in the labyrinth um 
T. Susan Chang calls it the farthest shore. So we may feel lost at first. I think there's a, there is a feeling of like confusion and a feeling like, I don't know where to go now. I've, I've, I've released the past. Um, I think that when we saw the Saturn Jupiter conjunction in Aquarius, we knew that the, the old way of doing things had to change. Like that this was a whole new reality that we had to step into. And I think we're going to feel a sense of di disorientation at first, especially when we're starting to see things like AI come and be more prevalent in our life, like with the AI art movement, like and in, in figuring out what is real and what isn't is going to be part of the challenge, I think, of the first portion of Saturn moving through uh, Pisces. Yeah. And also, you know, I think Saturn brings reckonings. I think Saturn says this has to change because it is run its course and it's not working. This needs to mature. This needs to crumble in some cases, or this new thing needs to be built. You know, there are many things uh, that, have, that came up in our research about like taking responsibility for your, your dream. Okay. Some dreams are going to die during Saturn and Pisces. So some dreams die, but others will conc concretize into form. So for, for one dream to become real, you have to release the other dreams. You have to say, those dreams are not going to be pursued. So that's the, the, the balancing part of that. Because you don't um, have enough time for all of your dreams. So Saturn right? is cutting off and working. I think we'll feel that impact of time a lot. Time, um, yeah. How are we going to prioritize what we want to do? Because we want to do everything, uh, yeah. but it's just not sustainable. It's just not possible. It's not there for our our future longevity our future good yeah. so saturn's bringing all of that and we're going to really feel it in a big way and you know i think that the saturn and aquarius time uh you know we've really felt a lot of distance with one another like with the zoom the, the prevalence of zoom calls and things like that i think that there is going to be a desire to dissolve some of those boundaries and to merge again emotionally, um, for better or for worse. I mean, I think that there are some advantages of having Saturn in its own domicile for having, you know, mental discipline and healthy boundaries. But some of those things get real challenging when we get to Saturn in Pisces. Um, you know, when we move to the, did that, is that a decent uh, exploration of the first decade, would you oh, say? Yeah, beautiful. Okay. Always. Okay. <laughs> Always very comprehensive with you. Um, when we get to the second decan, we see the Nine of Cups with a figure who is feeling very satisfied. This is like a, a, a feeling of satiation. Um, this card, I think, is one of acceptance, but also aspiration, um, where if you think about it, if we, we, we look at our matrix metaphor, You've got the leaving of the matrix world and waking up to a new reality in the first decade. Then you have the training montage, you know, where he's the apprentice, where he's, I know Kung Fu, you know, where he's like learning Kung Fu and like learning that he has the ability to manipulate the matrix, to manipulate, you know, spiritual energy to create a phys a, an experience of physical reality within that matrix of possibility. Um, and, and there's a little bit of a sorcerer's apprentice energy with this Deccan. It's a double Jupiter energy. So we go from a Saturn ruled Deccan to a double Jupiter Deccan where it's like anything is possible, right? Like if we only, if we can dream it, if you can will it, it is no dream. That's like the, the from the Big Lebowski, right? Theodore Herzl. This is the real sort of the magic Deccan. Oh, yeah. This is where the magic it's happens. Very Jupiterian. Very, it's like one of the most Jupiter decans in the entire circle. Um, and we, we should also like think about too, I like to think about Pisces as a, a dual sign. It's not just Jupiterian, it is it is Venusian as well. So think about the 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 harmonizing quality of Jupiter, the merging quality, the the, uh, the beautification. The, the desire to see beauty through through harmony okay like jupiter is related to harmony and peacemaking um, but we can be attracted to those things and there's this water has this quality of be, being able to be a solvent and bring things together 
So I think that there's a strong desire to merge reality and dream in the second decade. And right. so in, in our current times, that will be the first half of 2024. Essentially, that could be a particularly great six months for magic for all those so. magically inclined. Yeah, right. Nice. We have to be careful too, though, because sometimes Saturn will deny something in the deck in itself. And it will cause us to have to work or have more patience for the thing that it represents. I've seen this in natal charts and in clients. Saturn in your natal chart can can completely cut you off from that energy. Like, let's say we had Saturn, uh, for example, Lana Wachowski has Saturn in the second decade of Pisces. There was probably a time when when she felt cut off from magic in her youth. I don't I don't know her story very well, um, but but where she felt like she was not able to merge worlds. And then eventually people will grow into that and be able to manifest that as they get older, if they're doing the work of Saturn, okay, if they're doing the hard work of Saturn. So I think that we will have to have patience with our dreams, like maybe our dreams would go slower, you know, like maybe they will slow down and we have to realize that our dream takes work to manifest. Um, with Saturn in that decan of Pi Pisces, we also have to be very careful of hubris. That decan has a lot of mythological significance with um, Prometheus's assistant Dolus, who was uh, basically two, two, two figures, Dolus and Phaethon. And both of them were apprentices or, you know, young people that were trying to copy the master. In Dolus's case, he was Prometheus's assistant, and he tried to fashion um, humanity from clay like Prometheus was doing while Prometheus was off on like business or something like that. But he ran out of clay and he could only uh, craft enough for the body without the feet. So... Prometheus was pretty impressed by this when he came back and said, you know what, I'm going to fire my version, which is complete, and we're going to call that Aletheia, truth. And we're also going to put yours in the kiln that is missing the feet, and we're going to call that pseudologos, which means falsehood. So to me, we have to figure out what is true, what isn't. The truth will always be able to run and keep running, while falsehood will, will eventually fall down. Um, yeah, faith on think Saturn but, will help in that for us. Yeah. It's gonna call it out. It's gonna bring out the consequences and not, not yes. let Saturn is a total reality check time. Yeah. yeah. If you've got your rose colored Jupiterian and Pisces dream that you started last year or whatever, now it's gets real. <laughs> like, you know. Um but yeah, I think that you know, Faith on also was like was Helios's son and wanted his his dad the the lord of the sun to allow him to drive his chariot uh and you know to prove that he was the son of a of the god of the deity mm -hmm. and helios was like please anything but that <laughs> like you're not ready and but he made a promise to him and he let him drive the chariot and he of course all hell broke loose and you know he burned up the sky and the earth and all this and eventually zeus had threw a lightning bolt at him and knocked him out of the sky and he drowned in the river Eurydonis. The, this is the story of the fixed star Achernar, right? Uh, was related to that faith on myth. So we have to be, it's a sort of the Icarus story too, like where we're flying a little bit too high. Yeah. So just be careful of overconfidence around that period of time. Yeah. Um, I mean, that yes, double Jupiter is, it's a sing, symbol of extremes, right? Totally, 100%. So, so, yeah, so, so whilst that second decan then is potentially very fruitful, we have to be cautious um, mm -hmm. that we're not taking things too far, that we're not taking on what we can't keep up or what, what's going to fall down, that kind of right. thing. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So what does a third so, decan hold? So when we get to the third decan, we have the Ten of Cups where we see, you know, a happy family underneath uh, an ephemeral rainbow. Um, the combination of water and fire, because this decan is going to be the in-between phase between the last decan of Pisces and the beginning of Aries. So this is like water and fire make rainbow. Okay. Uh, right. 
yeah. uh, which is pretty neat. Um, this is a Mars ruled decan, so we go we go Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Chaldean order, all right. And when you have a Mars, when you have Mars and Pisces, you could say, right? Um, there is a crusading energy. This is a, I'm willing to fight for my beliefs. I'm willing to sacrifice for my beliefs. I'm willing to martyr myself for my dream. Okay, so we have to be careful of what we sacrifice for when Saturn's moving through the third decan of Pisces. There could be consequences to feeling like we are a victim or a martyr or that we, we might go, we may get a check to going too far in pursuit of a dream, potentially. The spirit associated with that decan is Elpis, which, which translates to hope, and it's related to the Pandora's box um, myth. So all the ills of the world being unleashed through uh, Pandora as punishment for uh, Prometheus stealing fire from the gods. This is why Zeus created Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. And all those ills were unleashed, but hope, Elpis, remained underneath the lip of the, of the jar. And there's wild emotional mood swings in the third decade of, of Pisces. And I think that Saturn may attempt to stabilize and balance uh, how we go to extremes emotionally. You know, it's mm -hmm. saying, hey, relax a little bit. Maybe you've taken this, um, this emotional experience a little bit too far. Um, we, we may have to really be very careful. Another thing that just comes to mind with this is that when we have the urge to merge everything into a homogenous whole, sometimes that can lead to uh, a fanatical type of uh, mm -hmm. belief system. And it also can lead to things like cultural genocide, where we say everything needs to be homogenous and this is not, does not fit the narrative. That's so, that single focus, focusness of um, Mars there ruling that decade. Right, yeah. right. So just be very careful around that period of time to mm -hmm. maintain your hope, try not to fall prey to despair, or morose, like with a feeling of doom, okay? But also figure out, like, if you are going to sacrifice for something, make sure that it's worthy, make sure that it's balanced, and that we're not, you know, painting ourselves as martyrs or victims in a circumstance that maybe doesn't require it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think well, we there's have to... that sort of risk of volatility a bit in that third decan, it seems. And I mean, yeah. as it goes, when Saturn moves into Aries, I mean, that's a whole nother story, but that's potentially yeah. a time that's going to be quite challenging collectively for all of us, you know, post sort of 2026. But I can see how this third decan could be building up to that. You know, this yeah. volatility, the single focusness of, uh, you know, like crazy ideas perhaps being willed upon, like, uh, upon your life. Um, yeah, potentially these two malefic planets ruling, you know, being in that vicinity of that third decan could be something that we need to watch out for. And that's probably more later down the track, you know, so, you know, around 2025 is when we'll see Saturn going into that third decan. Well, and consider too that Pisces is a place of change. It is a, a, a mutable, double-bodied, cadent sign, right? Where it's the transition in the in the northern hemisphere between winter and spring, and and around my neck of the woods, it gets it turns into a muddy soup, like the the ice melts into the and it create and it merges with Earth to create this very fertile uh, mixture that eventually will feed the plants. So the, the new shoots of spring in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm actually curious as to how that plays out on the Southern Hemisphere. What, what does Pisces season represent in nature down there? Um, this year, I have no idea because we, <laughs> we have had all of our seasons flip. We're only yeah. starting to really get into summer now, uh, which is wow. when we're usually starting to pull out all of us, our summer things and so who knows? But but generally, I think Pisces season is a time of bounty. Like we get a lot of produce at that time of the year. Um, it's starting to cool off. So we're starting head, to head into that autumn. Um, things starting to die down, but not quite yet. So this is a, often a really lovely time of the year to be out and 
not too hot in the heat and not too cold yet. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So I can see how the bounty of Jupiter kind of comes in. Um, but, yeah, this third Deccan does, I mean, it does sort of concern me a little bit, even though the card looks really happy rainbows. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there is kind of a facade there, like some smokes and yeah. mirrors around, you know, um, how how honourable our dreams and ideals are. Like, are they only self-serving or are they really one for the collective? And I think the more work that we do in the first two decans of cutting down and of um, uh, in, in the second decan of really working through the process uh, will hopefully lead to a better third decan of like um, being able to discern something that's more valuable and of service and to the world and a greater connection to wholeness and unity and, and collective um, idea. So there's, there's a real ephemeralness to that deck and too. like rainbows are very temporary, like they're beautiful. And, but if you're trying to like, you know, build your entire life around the rainbow, um, you know, you're, you're going to have problems because it's there one day and it's or one minute and it's gone the next. Right. Yes. So, so I think that there's, there's challenges that come with uh, how do we take advantage of the time that we have and appreciate the beauty of the moment without um, getting too attached to it. I think that's the less there's a detachment lesson in that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let's move on to some historical um, examples sure. only because this example of Nelson Mandela really speaks to, I think, what we've just been speaking about, you know, especially in that third decan, um, where in 1964, Saturn had moved into Pisces, and that's when Nelson Mandela was imprisoned into Robben Island, uh, which was basically a labour camp, and him and the prisoners there, their job every day was essentially to break rocks into gravel. Uh, and then the next time Saturn moved into Pisces again in 1994. Nelson Mandela was freed from prison uh, recently before that and had won a Nobel Peace Prize um, and then became the first black president of South Africa. So lots of Piscean themes there, lots of Saturn and Pisces themes there. I, I mean, just that idea of breaking rocks into gravel, like dissolving the stone, you know, I think is so... Uh, such a strong Saturn in Pisces imagery, but um, what I also see is that the there is the ideals that he held so strongly. Um, you know these these ideas about how society should be organised, uh, ideals about humanity, um, and the whole way that humanity should be unified, is what he was fighting for. Um, and he suffered, you know, he, he was that Mars in, um, so third decan of Pisces, he really was the victim and the martyr there, wasn't he? But he, he held on, you know, you've got to give him that. Um, well, and, and you, you could see that something that was born at the beginning of one Saturn cycle, it comes to fruition uh, at, the, at the next one, right? There's always kind of connections with things that begin and end when at the beginning and ending of the Saturn cycle itself. Mm. So he was imprisoned during the beginning of the Saturn cycle. And then he was actually able to manifest his dream at the end of it. Right. right. That, that, uh, story reminds me a lot of the movie, the Shawshank redemption, which came out in 1994, which is also when Saturn was in Pisces and that movie that's one of my favorite movies i don't, I don't know Very i just good. it's so beautiful yeah and it, it really speaks to kind of what nelson mandela potentially was having to go through like false being falsely accused of something having to maintain his inner faith while in a prison while in exile while being contained within something you could even look at this as like jupiter or Zeus, or, or or not Jupiter, but one of the other children, because Zeus was actually hidden away from Kronos, inside the belly of Kronos, biding their time to be, you know, liberated by Jupiter or Zeus. Mm. So I, I think that 
that movie talks about how he created beauty and faith within the most difficult circumstance that you could have. And if you even take your metaphor of crushing uh, boulders into little pebbles, the way that he escaped from prison, spoilers if you haven't seen it, he, he, he chipped away at the, at the rock like yeah. for like years, for Building decades, <laughs> like, <you> know, like <laughs> to, to escape, <laughs> to go to the ocean and to yeah. merge with uh, oneness again. Yeah. So. I mean, what really touched me about that character, which I can see in Nelson Mandela as well, is this level of integrity and passiveness and the solidity right. of, of silence within him. And I, I did do a bit of research about him in prison, Nelson Mandela in prison, and it, said he was able to win over a lot of the prison guards just by, you know, being firm where he needed to be and being fair and, um, you know, just having that honour and integrity, which, you know, are all very Jupiterian words as well. That's a very positive expression of Jupiter. Um, And And, and and that's how how Andy Dufresne did it in that movie as well. So it was the same same, same kind of thing, right? He he was just... You know his integrity helped him make a lot of friends and that yeah. eventually uh you know helped him survive that's right and there was this um i guess this whole sacrifice and being prisoner to president um and and basically having this almost like jesus consciousness like yes you're a martyr and you're a victim but at the same time you're also revered um and i think we could possibly see some of this archetypal imagery play out over the next couple of years this sort of Jesus consciousness like people being idealized and um and put on a pedestal for for something you know like for for whatever reasons but I I think that's a very Piscean thing and uh Saturn of course making it a, a, a reality in our perception of like looking at the good in everyone looking um whether whether looking at the good in someone is through our rose-colored glasses or not so that's both a warning as well as a nice thing uh, I mean Saturn also could bring the consequences of doing something of that nature true. so Absolutely. so Saturn could also be like hey you've been putting this person on a pedestal here's what they really are like and that's maybe right. yes True. Yeah, so so true. And on the topic of movies, um, another Mm -hmm. movie that was a Saturn in Pisces movie um, was Brandon Lee in The Crow. So he was killed on the set of The Crow in 1994. And Brandon Lee, uh, who's the son of Bruce Lee, was born with Saturn in Pisces. And he was killed on the set of The Crow at his Saturn return when Saturn moved back into Pisces. And this was an incredible story, and I, I remember this as a as a teenager. You know how big this was. You know this was big news, and it was kind of said that the movie probably wouldn't have done so well had this not have happened, right? And there was this sort of cult following of this movie, as you see again the idealization and the mania. But what had happened was that the crew had checked all the guns to make sure that they were all in order and they tested some of the guns with real bullets um but one of the real bullets didn't actually in fact come out it was actually lodged and stuck into the barrel of the gun uh and so they thought that the bullet had come out because they'd shot the gun but of course when the gun was then prepared and used on the film and the set with blanks uh it actually pushed out this lodged bullet in the barrel and that's what eventually killed um brandon lee so partly it was accidental but also negligence at the same time that created Mm. this very tragic consequence so we're seeing here um you know more of the tragic and you know sorrowful side of saturn coming through here um but i mean just the significations like the crow like that is a the spirit animal of Saturn, right? Like the, the, the movie was The Crow. It was very sort of emo and black and dark, uh, underworldy. Um, uh, and, you know, just even the fact that the bullet was lodged, you know, Saturn rules obstructions um, and blockages um, and, and death for that matter. So I thought this was an incredible case study around Saturn in Pisces. Um 
Do you yeah, see but, any other um, connections there to Saturn in Pisces? Well, I think that the the film industry is a is a connection. I would say, I would say Pisces is a a myth making machine, right? I think that nice. Pisces is all about symbol and figurative language rather than the literal, and where we were seeing consequences to irresponsibility within the film industry and image making and and you know myth making um you know another think piggybacking off of that if we just think about other types of movies the other thing that saturn and pisces would do is it would make fantastic worlds real so like if you look, go down the list here uh jurassic park was another one that came out during that time period where it was like literally we saw dinosaurs come to life and people's minds were like what these this is like the creation of like a fantasy right the concretization of a fantasy but it was also a cautionary tale of like here's the consequences of making a dream a reality that's another saturn and pisces movie that i think it's like oh just because you can doesn't mean that you should because remember the, the the like Colonel Sanders looking guy in, in Jurassic Park, right? Where he, it was his dream to like bring people joy, and yeah. um, but it, it it went haywire. Yeah. You know, another another movie that had um, during that period of time was Toy Story, where that was the first uh, completely computer generated movie. So we had a whole world coming to life uh, that that had not existed before. That was just a feigned appearance of Saturn on some level. Mm. Um, yes, and and just on that, I mean, even from the finishing of the, making the film The Crow, they yeah. had to employ a lot of new technology, um, CGI technology that was in its infancy at that stage to finish the last few scenes of that movie. And I think sure. that's one of the things that we've seen with Saturn in Pisces is the advancements in technology um that has been able to bring worlds like um impossible worlds to re reality um like yeah. we saw in jurassic park uh, and toy story right so totally it, there's something to do with these merging of realities the clashing of realities that make you question what is actually real and what is not real like we're going through with ai right now well mm -hmm. is this painting real or is it um computer generated i mean there's definitely some aspirational qualities to it though too like the 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 star trek tv show came out for the first time in 1966 when saturn was in pisces the 30 years prior and that was like literally like you know boldly going where no one had gone before like off into the unknown this futurism type of thing yeah um yeah. you know i think that the other thing it'll bring is a, is accountability to those like we were seeing with the Brandon Lee story though like one another thing that happened during the 90s the mid 90s when Saturn was in Pisces was Congress in America started having all these meetings on violent video games and their effects and say okay should we be allowed to have this violence come to life uh, which uh, it was in reference to that video game mortal Kombat. i don't know if you remember mortal Kombat, but it was mm -hmm. very realistic the violence was very realistic and mm -hmm. and that really uh got people very upset at the time um, i know now we've become completely desensitized to that kind of thing but back then it was a it was a big deal i remember because i was 14 at the time and i yeah. i was like what's and so, i think that was yeah, also the, the, the technology was able to make it look so real. It's the illusions mm -hmm. that we see mm -hmm. a lot in Pisces, the, right. the imagery, the illusions, the smoke and mirrors. This is what, what it does so well. And that's why I think movies is such a good platform for that Saturn in Pisces. Um, so yeah. I wouldn't be surprised um, in this iteration that we uh, see um, advances in um, yeah, technology is to do with illusions. Um, I know AI is one, but, you know, stuff that we don't probably even know about, you know, the things that make magic really real, essentially, um, could be. Yeah, the, me the metaverse, I guess, like people trying to create all these like goggles to, to give you a, a different sensory experience, to, to literally put you into a different world and have you be 
feeling and, and acting. And, you know, I think that the danger, there's, there's a danger to this, though. The danger is disassociation, escapism, and not being in our physical bodies and trying to be in some other fantastical world because our real worlds are, are you know, so challenging. Like, the pandemic has shown me that, like, it's sometimes it's very difficult to to live in the real world and you can feel very isolated and, and that can that can lead to the fo the formation of of technologies where people are like well i don't this this world's too tough or, or like all these dystopian futures where we've we've you know raped and pillaged the land to the point where it's just a burning wasteland i don't know have you ever seen that movie ready ready player one right yeah. no it's, it's it's basically about uploading your consciousness into a video game right. and because the the earth itself was just so messed up same yeah. thing with like wally -E, right where you, you have to leave on a spaceship because we've destroyed the earth type mm -hmm. of thing and uh which is a recurrent theme in these movies it, it is yeah and just on before when you mentioned that um pisces is that myth making symbol making yeah. machine well, in 1994, Prince also became the symbol, the artist formerly known yeah. as Prince. So I thought, wow, right. that's pretty cool. <laughs> he has a Pisces um, moon. He has a Pisces I moon too. He? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's just this idea of formlessness um, mm -hmm. that the idea of the zeitgeist, I think, really exists in that Piscean um, energy. Um, that there is no form, that there is unity, that everything blends together like a big gas. And that's one of the things that I, I think will be really good with Saturn moving into Pisces is I'm hopeful for a coming together, whether that happens collectively in our community or whether that happens within your, your mind or individual cells, like an integration, a unity that happens um, I'm just thinking that, uh, for example, um, Alcoholics Anonymous was created or founded on a Saturn in uh, Pisces event. Right. Um, and their whole ethos was to firstly accept each other and come together and to find God in whatever ways that you can, like whether it's through meditation, whether it's through religion or exercise or whatever you call your spiritual practice. And that finding God was the 12 step path towards overcoming your addiction. So I thought that was yeah. a very Saturn in Pisces idea, but it kind of draws on this whole notion of, um, yeah, being in that, ex being in that bubble and expanding together. Um, but also uh, sobriety. Like, so I think that's the oh, biggest sobriety. thing True, to me yeah. Is, yeah. is that there's consequences for your, you know, for addictions and escapism and challenges like that. And how do we get sober together, right? Yeah. In a very Piscean way. Uh -huh. but, but, but make no mistake that, that the, it's not just a, the goal of Alcoholics Anonymous is not just merging with a higher power. It's to get sober. So like, right. <laughs> yeah. so, like, I mean, that's really the, the foundation of it. That's just yeah. the method. So yeah. yeah, I think that's a good, that's a really good example of like saying, okay, it's taking responsibility for your addiction yeah. and you know through faith through faith yeah so there's this real conc concretization of um these piscean tendencies like bringing it down to reality no more letting it sort of waft in our peripherals but letting it be understood and embodied and for it to be worked on is, I think, a Saturn in Pisces um, way. And and as you as you're going through that process, you start to see the reality of your dreams coming true. As in, AKA the hard work that that's involved in, true. say, ending apartheid. You know, all the hard work that went, you know, to creating this union. You know, it didn't just happen out of thin air. Like people had to go to jail for it. It took 30 years, you know. Um, but also one of the other coming together stories was the establishment of a single European market as well. That happened at Saturn in, in Pisces. So I see a lot of, in historically, a lot of coming togetherness, um, mm -hmm. which is a hopeful thing to go into um, for for the next few years. So, so Spencer, is there, you know, we, 
you know, can you kind of give us a summary now as to, you know, what what do you think are the big things that we need to watch out for? What are the big lessons of Saturn in Pisces over the next couple of years that we should all be aware of? Well, I think that Saturn is going to use the imagery and resources of the sign that it's in to be able to carry out its agenda. And I think that we're going to see all, some things related to the oceans as well come up. I think that's going to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. I was seeing a story recently of a, a young gentleman. What's his name here? Boy, Boyan Slat, who is a young Dutchman who um, is the leader of the nonprofit Ocean Cleanup. I saw a story today that he just recently received a $25 million donation from the Airbnb CEO to fund his project that he's that has been his dream for many, many years. And this this young gentleman was born with Saturn and Pisces. Mm. And I think that we'll see a, a need to take responsibility for our ocean, for our yeah. oceanic systems. Yeah. I think and we'll he's see going through his Saturn in uh, right. Saturn return, right? Saturn because return. I remember he was I listened to a podcast interview with him on Joe Rogan years ago, and he was young. I couldn't believe yeah, super how young, young he was. Yeah, so, yeah, it gives me hope that young right. people are, are there to kind of fix up the mess of the older generation. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it's a very hopeful story. I read it on, on, an, on an app I have called the Good News Network, so I was like, oh, yeah, okay. that's that's awesome. <laughs> like, let's clean up the oceans. Um <laughs> So yeah, a, a really inspiring story, but in, really interesting that he's going through a Saturn return as we were talking about. He has a responsibility to the ocean, like uh, and Pisces being that oceanic consciousness merging, you know, thing that we all share, that resource that we all share, um, that living entity that that we we share. Um, I also think I th we're going to have to get responsible, you know, like we talked about with Alcoholics Anonymous. We've seen a proliferation of like marijuana, you know, stores in America and things like that. And I think that there may be some consequences to um, drug use and things of that nature. You know, if we didn't really talk about Kurt Cobain yet, but Kurt Cobain committed suicide after uh, a heroin, you know, journey back in 1994. And that really started people asking questions about drug use and, and things of that nature. So I think that there's a reckoning with trying to be realistic about our escapist tendencies, our, our need to go off into another world. Mm -hmm. it, it will both bring it down to earth and make it real, but it'll also show us that, hey, there's a responsibility that we need. There's a reality check that's going to come in with that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, and I also think, I mean, we've, we've locally uh, in Australia, we've just had approval for psych psychiatrists to administer psilocybin as a treatment wow. so right. that was pretty big news this week um and i thought half of the course was satin in pisces so well but think about like a combination with that could be not that we would not use psilocybin but that now it's a regulated government program do you see yeah. what i'm saying so there's That's regulations right. around it that's right yeah. it's official so so we might see more things like that where where it just becomes more structured instead of like just the wild west we maybe we will find more people turning to psychedelics to, for healing and things of that nature but it's probably going to be more supported by the structures of society so that it's done responsibly rather than in a way that is irresponsible yeah well i saw today that there was a um there was an advertisement for one of the hospitals looking for people with a methamphetamine addiction to go mm -hmm. on a psilocybin trial. So, mm -hmm. so we're seeing, I guess, a new method here of psilocybin trying to heal addictive um, problems. Uh, so, yeah, that, that just literally was hot off the press this morning. I just read that. Uh, so very, we're very close to the ingress now. We're really starting to see this wave, this Saturn in Pisces, Pisces wave falling over us. This could potentially really transform the way we see the world um, just like how Albert Einstein's sort of theory of relativity that came that was discovered that he came up with at a Saturn in Pisces um, transit um, that completely changed the way 
we saw the universe. So, so this is potentially, you know, the next couple of years, one of those periods of time. So it's something that we could all, you know, um, be on this cutting edge, um, you know, border of, you know, of walking between these two worlds. Yeah, just showing us how interconnected we all are. I mean, True. you know, if we think about, I, I'm I'm a fan of fungi and of mycelial networks, and I've been learning a lot about mushrooms lately. Um, not necessarily just psychedelics, but just mushrooms in general and how they, you know, the networks that they have are are can stretch for miles and miles and miles. And we sometimes when we think of a mushroom, we just think of the fruiting body that is in a, a, a temporal space. And to me, you know, Pisces is like a mycelial network where it shows us the, the strata that's under the ground that connects all of us, that is interdependent. And then we, we pop up as individuals, you know, but we're connected through these, these networks. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we, maybe we'll see, that being said, maybe we'll see some, some uh, research with mushrooms uh, that are, we, we've already started seeing this mushrooms that are that eat plastics and mm, that eat like, that like toxic up. waste yeah clean yeah. up exactly yeah. so using yeah. that underground you know uh, strata to to remedy something that has got, fallen into disrepair could be something we see too mm. um and i think well, just to, just binding us to our our feelings again we've yeah. we've had to become so hyper rational um, you know, and, and disconnected in a way to see the big picture, to like figure out where we're going. But I think we're going to want to feel again. We're going to be bound to, to feeling. Yeah, that's nice. So that's something that, um, yeah, bringing, yeah, infusing spirit, but also infusing our emotions and feelings into a concrete, a concrete way of living. So that it, it really is what Saturn's doing, bringing us back to equilibrium. So I think that's a really lovely note to end on um, and something to look forward to for the next three years. Um, but so I really wanted to thank you, Spencer. Your insights have been really incredible. Um, always love talking to you and nerding out on these topics. Um, I know you're super busy and you've got, got a lot going on. Can you quickly share what's going on right now, what you've got on offer? Um, and how people can get in touch. Yeah, you can you can find me at spencermichaud.com. Um, that's my website. I also have a YouTube channel, Spencer Michaud Astrology. And I do weekly uh, new moon and full moon forecasts. Uh, they're basically live streams where I have a community come and ask questions, contribute. Sometimes we have a guest. You've been a guest on the show. And we have discussions. Um, I also do this with the astrology of the month. And it's just really creating a nice community and discussion. And, and I'm a fan of long form content. You can tell that I'm a little bit long winded. So I apologize for that. But, but I like taking the time and the, and the space to really dive into depth with things. Um, I, I just can't do like the five minute video. Like, so if you're, if you're looking for. No uh, TikToks for you, Spencer. No, I'm not on TikTok. So I am on Instagram. <laughs> And begrudgingly on Twitter, but I'm not active that much yeah. on Twitter. But what I will say, if you're if you want long form, if you want like to to merge into a topic uh, and explore it from every angle, that's the type of thing that I I like to do. Um, I also have readings. I, I do um, you know natal readings, transit readings, mythos readings, where we look at your your mythological stories, your decans, all of those things. Um, and I do guided group studies every once in a while as well, where we, we pick a book and we uh, work together as on a group with it. I think the next book I'm going to do is a book that talks about mycelium. It's called The Flowering Wand uh, by oh. Sophie Strand. Nice. So I think that's, that's going to be our spring book where we're going to dive into the idea of myth popping up uh, over different cultures, but sharing mycelial networks mm, nice. through time and space. It was no co um, mistake or coincidence, I don't know what the right word is, that I decided to invite you in for the Saturn show because I know you are very thorough and, um, you know, have a lot of substance behind your your words. So yeah. I thought you were a very fitting candidate for this show. Oh, and Thank you. 
And you also are speaking at the Nightlight Speaker Series. Um, I think this video will be out just in time if you're getting the message now, like you can quickly sign up right now to see Spencer talk. Um, what are you going to be talking about there? Yeah, I'm going to be doing a talk on, it's called Stars and Cards, incorporating the tarot into your astrological practice as a storytelling device. So a lot of the stories that we told with the Rider Waite Tarot here today, um, I'm going to show you kind of how to make those connections, some of the correspondences with astrology, because that's really kind of the foundation of what I do in my work and my readings is, is utilize those visual aids to help people with their, their personal mythologies and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, we're going to be exploring that. Um, it's, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll have a good talk about, about the tarot and how it all connects and all the networks that we're exploring. I did want to add, shoot, I, I did an I Ching reading for Saturn and Pisces. Would you like uh -huh. to hear yes, the I Ching that we to. got? If we have a, few, a minute more, sorry oh, to be so expansive about it. But I got number 52, which is called Keeping Still, the Mountain, Restraint, mm. Being Quiet, Attaining Inner Peace. Uh, and I got changing line number five, which says, He keeps his jaw still. His words have order, then regrets vanish. So to me, this is like learning to be, not having to like always like, there's so much chatter that we're going, what's going on in social media. And like, we're always trying to, to do more things. We're trying, we're being forced to like grind it out. And every, every action that we do has to have some kind of like ulterior motive. And I think people are getting kind of fed up with that. And they're, they're, I think they're going to feel more about like, let's just relax Let's just allow ourselves to be who we are in the moment without any other like mask that we put on or like ulterior motive or agenda. So more, and that's, more silence, less noise, basically. Yes. And just, you know, Simon and Garfunkel's The Sound of Silence came out during a Saturn in Pisces. So oh, <laughs> right. yes, the, the power of stillness and quietness, right? Yeah, and that changes right. to hexagram 53, which is called developing gradually, gradual advance, slow and steady development, faithfulness and persistence. So I think we're just going to see a slowing down. And, uh, yeah. you know, I think we all could use a little bit of oceanic um, acceptance, just accepting us ourselves as we, as we are, rather than this, you know, always this aspirational, um, we have to do or be more or keep grinding. I mean, I think I'm preaching to the choir here with you because, you know, you, you work very hard on your farm, but I think that you have the ability to like sink into, you know, a oneness out there from what you've told me in the past too. So I, I, I admire that. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's a very Taoist, isn't it? The, uh, yeah. that hexagram 52 is just about Oops. that eternal. You still yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's the eternal space that that goes beyond this life that you can tap into right now if you're still. And I always visualize Saturn in Pisces as that uh, that island in the middle of the ocean. You know, Saturn. You know, island. You know, the the mass and clump of land in this vast expanse of the ocean. And what yeah. else can you do there but to just be still and to to sit. <laughs> so, I have one more offering for you, Shu, okay, before great. we end today. Yep. A friend of mine who has, um, he, he has Jupiter in Pisces, okay? Nice. Uh, right on Fomahol, the fixed star at the oh, beginning. Oh, wow. Okay. Posted this, this quote um, from the diction, I believe it's called the Dictionary of Melan a Melancholy. <laughs> it's a book where an author made up new words to describe feelings right. and this sounds like the opposite of your good news channel <laughs> yeah yeah but but it, it was brilliant this word that they came up with it the word that the, this author came up with was ambido and it, it is a noun and this is a made-up word by the way but it, it he describes it as a noun of melancholic trance in which you become completely absorbed in vis vivid sensory details raindrops skittering down a window Tall trees leaning in the wind, clouds of cream swirling in your coffee, briefly soaking in the experience of being alive, an act that is done purely for its own sake. Mm, nice. That's a good lesson 
uh, to take on totally. That mindfulness, I think. Is. Yeah, mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for that. I'll have to look up this. What is it? The Dictionary of Melancholy? Yeah, it's like the, yeah, not the, let me find the author here real quick. Uh, is is I just, it a book or is it an online re resource? Um, it is a book now. Okay. So let me see. Sorry to drag this out. This is, <laughs> this is the problem I have. Um, it is the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows oh. by John, uh, by John Koenig. <laughs> <laughs> and like he's a, like, interesting yeah, he's, book. he's like a poet or something like that. And he, you know, he's <laughs> making up all these new words for, to describe different emotions. Oh, nice. And I think em emotional intelligence will, will be, is really like something we'll see with Saturn and Pisces and things of that nature. So bringing an experience to our, uh, our ineffable things, like being able to describe it, being able to just be rather than to do. And yeah. I think that that book describes it well. Well, it's like what you said before, it's that Saturn in Pisces is about actually getting in touch and in, infusing more of our emotions uh, right. into our lives. So that's a really great Saturn in Pisces book to get. I'll definitely be there you go. one up. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for this um, fabulous discussion. I think this will be a really great resource for the next couple of years. Um, I'm, I'm Shu Yap and I'm an astrologer, teacher and writer in the field of astrology. So I'll be um, opening, I've got consultations happening this year as well as astrological mentoring and I'm doing a few things with Kepler College this year. So um, best thing to do is to probably get on my mailing list to be kept in the loop with all of my happenings. Um, all of our uh, contact details, both Spencer and mine and Reverend Jangle Bones, um, will be in the description below. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button and to support our show. So thank you. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you at the next episode.